are huge, much larger compared to those simple sugars. While simple sugars are either one sugar or two sugars, the polysaccharides are hundreds or thousands of sugar units. And really we can divide them into two groups. We can talk about the ones that you can digest and the ones that you can't. So the ones that you can digest are your, sorry, are your flour or sugar based, your flour, or sorry, your flour, wheat, grain type based foods, the starches. Right along in there is a polysaccharide that we make called glycogen. So we'll talk about the digestible. We can actually form or break down glycogen depending on if what our blood sugar is. Then you have the non-digestible. So the non-digestible, these are the ones that you can't break down. Cellulose is a good example. You know cellulose as fiber. So you know it kind of as its common name. It's commonly listed as fiber, but its actual scientific name is that it's fiber or it's cellulose. Okay. So last time we kind of started with the monosaccharides and just looking at like characteristics of monosaccharides. Remember I said that monosaccharides either have aldehydes or ketones. They tend to be five and six carbons in length. And they're polyalcohols. Remember, that means many alcohols. And if you look, it really looks like every carbon, except for carbon number one, has an OH. So there's lots of alcohol groups on a sugar, and that's going to help make it polar. So this is why when you take table sugar, put it in water, stir it up, it completely dissolves, is because of all those polar water molecules. So sugar, with all those alcohols, is polar, mixes well with water, doesn't separate. So the other one, and really the only thing you need, this primary, secondary, tertiary, just go back over that. The only reason you need to understand that is if they ask you a question about it in your homework. So remember that sugars are either aldehydes or ketones. Aldehydes is where you have that double bond oxygen on the end of the chain. Ketones is when you have a double bond oxygen in the middle of a chain. So here's a couple of examples of that. So we have in this first one a six carbon sugar that has an aldehyde on it. They would call that an aldohexose, right? So hexose tells you six sugars. Aldo tells you there's an aldehyde. So that means the double bond oxygen's on the end. Where's the one over on this side? If you count the number of carbons, you see there's only five. So that makes it a pentose. So hexoses are six carbon sugars. Pentoses are five carbon sugars. And then when you look for the double bond oxygen on this one, you can see the ketone. So remember that aldehydes are on the end. The double bond oxygen's on the end for the aldehyde. But a ketone is always going to be on that second carbon in the sugar. And it doesn't matter if it's a four or five, six carbon sugar. It's always going to be on carbon number two is where that double bond oxygen will be. So that's why you would call this a keto pentose. So then we talked about chiral. Just as a review, remember that chi chiral carbons have to have four single bonds. All the groups have to be different. And so we like immediately knocked out carbon number one and six in this molecule, the sugar molecules, glucose. But then notice that the other four, two, three, four, and five have the little red star next to them. And for all of those, if you compare the, the groups to the left, group to the right, they're both different. The entire group below, different. The entire group above, different. So all four of those carbons in the kind of interior of the sugar, they are all chiral. So that means you can make a lot of right and left-handed pairs. Remember that chiral carbons means that you can end up with right and left sides that you can't put on top of each other. So they're not identical. And we kind of like got to the very end. We were looking at this. So I was doing the comparison of the D glucose versus L glucose. So if you look at these two, you should see that these two look like if you put them in a mirror, they're on opposites. The alcohol groups, the hydrogen groups are on opposite sides for carbons two, three, four, and five. 
those chiral carbons. That is why the one that's in the middle is D-glucose. The one that's over on the right is called L-glucose. And D-glucose is the most abundant sugar that's found in nature, and it's always the D. And almost all sugars are D sugars. There's very few L sugars found in nature. So you kind of start to see that as a common theme. Kind of like, remember, the cis and trans fatty acids in nature, all bonds are cis. All fatty acid chains with a double bond, they're always cis. Trans is just not found in nature. Same thing here. Almost all of your sugars are found as D. There's very few examples of ones that are the mirror image of those. And a lot of that has to do with the enzymes that interact with these molecules. Kind of like you think like you shake your right hand with someone's right hand. If you try to shake your left hand with someone's right hand is very strange. Well, a lot of enzymes wouldn't recognize L-glucose. They are designed to fit with D-glucose. So that is where that specific type of sugar is much more commonly found. So then I gave you a couple of examples, like these are all isomers, and it's all because of these chiral carbons is the reason that you can end up with isomers. Remember, they have the same formula. These are special isomers. They're where the, only one chiral carbon is flipped compared to the others. And so notice in this, glucose, which is blood sugar, and galactose, which is part of milk sugar. So glucose, the fourth carbon, has its alcohol group on the right side, whereas galactose has its alcohol group on the left. And that's the only difference between those two molecules. But even still, it's enough of a difference that D-glucose has kind of evolved to be the most common sugar that's found. Mm -hmm. So if you look, do you see that between the first and the second, glucose and galactose, do you see that carbon one, two, three, five, and six are identical? Yes. Only carbon four is different. Yes. Okay. Then, but glucose is your blood sugar. Galactose is not. Even though there's only this like single group difference, it's enough of a difference that it did, has led to like glucose evolved or became the most common sugar. And, all, and typically there's enzymes that will recognize one and not the other, even though it's just that one difference sometimes. But again, you can kind of think of enzymes as being like a key, right? So I got a whole bunch of keys, but only one fits this room. Okay, even though so the little notches are just barely different, but there's enough of a difference that it's that specific. So on that last one, mm -hmm. where it says the HO on the other side, does that mean? Yep. That's so between galactose and talose, these are the only differences. Oh, okay, so notice there, galactose and talose are identical except for carbon number two. Okay. And they always number the carbon when they're listed like this in a chain. Carbon one is at the top, carbon six is at the bottom. It's always like one, it starts with one and goes down. It always starts with the aldehyde or the end closest to the ketone and the numbering of it, okay? So that's the only thing to remember is that there's a lot of possible arrangements because of these chiral carbons, but they actually have very specific patterns. So this was the one I said of all of them, I'm not gonna ask you to draw it, but you should be able to identify it. Okay, D-glucose, because it's the most abundant sugar found in nature, D-glucose is the one that you should recognize. So if someone talks about giving a patient dextrose or D5W as an IV solution, or if they have to be given sugar, it is typically D-glucose that's given to them. Because, so they say, glucose is the most abundant monosaccharide that's found in nature. Other words for it, dextrose. So dextrose and glucose, same thing. Grape sugar and then blood sugar. So dextrose, glucose, they're all the same term talking about blood sugar. So you find this sugar in fruit and vegetables. It's part of corn syrup. When glucose is used to build starches. Glucose is used to build cellulose or fiber. Glucose is half of the disaccharides we're going to talk about. So glucose is present in other sugars as well, other carbohydrate forms. 
Glucose is your primary nutrient energy source. So your cells would like to run on glucose more than anything else. Because if I take glucose, which is C6H12O6, that's a glucose molecule, right? Six carbons, it's an aldohexose. So if I have this six carbon molecule, if I add six oxygens to it, that will break down that glucose and form six carbon dioxides and six water molecules and ATP. So they say that this is the preferred nutrient energy source because look at what the products are. So the products, if I can break down, and this is complete combustion, remember when we do combustion, oxygen making carbon dioxide and water, your enzymes inside of your cell will take this six carbon molecule, split it down into six single carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules. And by breaking, it's oxidizing the sugar. The sugar's like the fuel, so the sugar is getting oxidized, but you're making six carbon dioxides. How do you get rid of carbon dioxide? You just do what? Just exhale, right? So carbon dioxide can get, you can excrete that easily. It diffuses out of the blood at the lungs. So it's just a waste gas. And as long as you have a normal functioning lung, pair of lungs, then you can get rid of it very easily. The other waste molecule or the other product is just water. So that just becomes part of the water that's in the cell. So do you see that if I take glucose, break it down, make carbon dioxide and water, there's not much waste molecules produced. So they monitor the amount of glucose that's in your blood because that is directly related to how much sugar your cells can get in order to make energy. So normal, when they talk about blood sugar, normal blood sugar is a range. It typically is somewhere between 60 and 110 milligrams of glucose per deciliter of blood. Now, they never talk about the units. They always just say, well, your blood sugar is 80. It's good. Or your blood sugar is 160. That's a little high. Right? So they just usually talk about a number. So when they're talking about that number, there actually are units to that number. It's milligrams of glucose, how much glucose is dissolved in the blood. That's your blood sugar. And 60 to 100 is considered good. Anything below is low blood sugar. Anything above becomes high blood sugar. So what do you call low blood sugar? What if it's low? Hypo. Mm -hmm. So it's hypoglycemia. That's if your blood sugar goes below 60. So hypoglycemia is when the blood sugar is less than 60. If it's over 110, then that is called what? Hyper. hyper. Mm -hmm. So hyper, and you'll actually see this again. Hyper always means above, like above what should be. Hypo always means like below what should be. This is if your blood sugar is over 110. So why does this happen? So diabetics commonly have difficulty getting glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cell because it needs to have a messenger. So the messenger is a hormone and that hormone is called insulin. So insulin is almost like the key that opens the door so that cells can take in glucose. And just like if your door, if your house is locked and you forgot your key, you're locked out. Same thing happens to your body cells. If insulin's not present, then your body cells do not know that there's glucose in the blood and there's no reason for them to open glucose doors or gates or channels and move glucose into the cell. So it really comes down to insulin, so let's talk about 
the different types. So they talk about diabetes and they say they're type one or type two. Type one is only about 10% of the diabetics that are in the United States. So this is only about 10% of cases. So in type one, this typically shows up around puberty. So this is kind of, and it doesn't have to be, like I've known some people that became type one diabetics in their forties for some reason, okay? But it's most commonly seen in around puberty. So sometime between 10 and 16. It's right around the time that you have your growth spurt. Now your cells are really ramping up energy and activity. So they need a lot more energy. So they start trying to burn glucose. Well, if there's no insulin, if there's no insulin, then I said, the cells do not know that sugar is in the blood. Somehow, there's some kind of damage to the pancreas. That's what causes this. So you stop secreting insulin. It might be damage to your beta cells. It might be genetic. It might be viral. There are some research that shows that children in childhood can have viral infections that where that virus infects the beta cells of the pancreas, which make insulin, and your immune system attacks and destroys those beta cells. So that's why they like infect the specific cells that make insulin. And that is part of an immune response. You have loss of those cells. So for whatever reason, you don't make insulin. No insulin means that your body cells can't pick up blood sugar. So blood sugar begins to go over 110. Normally, that would be a signal. Pancreas releases insulin. Insulin is the signal. Body cells take in sugar. Everything comes back down to normal. So this is kind of like what happens under the normal circumstances. But in diabetes, they don't have insulin. Blood sugar continues to elevate and they get into a state of what's called hyperglycemia. So remember I said that's when your blood sugar is over 110. If this just goes on for a short period of time, not such a big deal. But if this is prolonged, your body cells think that they're starving because the body cells are like, where's the glucose? There's none coming. They don't know that there's sugar in the blood without insulin. So there's three nutrient groups. So you have carbohydrates or sugar, you have fats and you have protein. So if the cells think there's no sugar, then the cells are going to burn the other two. So cells will begin to burn fat and protein. In doing that, protein is oftentimes muscle gets broken down. So this is why the type, type 1 diabetic seems like they like get weaker. They may seem to lose muscle mass. They may seem to start burning fat stores. So even though they might actually be eating a lot, they're actually getting smaller. The byproducts, remember I told you that when you burn glucose, you make carbon dioxide and water. When you burn fats and proteins as your primary source of energy, you have a lot of acids and a lot of nitrogen waste that your body has to get rid of. So this means your kidneys now have to kick in. So your kidneys now have acid byproducts that they have to get rid of. And if you can't get rid of them fast enough, the combination of high blood sugar and excessive ketones or acids in the blood can actually lead to a drop in your blood's pH. So a decrease in the blood's pH just means there's too much acid. So too much acid shuts down your nervous system. So person starts becoming really tired, lethargic. They may actually lose consciousness, go into a coma. And if they don't remedy this, this can actually lead to irreparable brain damage. They have to have insulin. So in this, insulin is required. It's not an option. So most of the time for these patients, they're brought in. Their blood sugar values are well over 110. I didn't know any of you have worked with any patients with, with diabetes. Who? Who? And so have you ever seen her blood sugar numbers? And what are they sometimes? Like what's a high for her? Like 
That's not bad. That's really not bad. Like my mother, like, like would be like, oh, I felt like having some ice cream yesterday. And so then the next morning she texts her blood sugar and is like 180. Okay. I've had um, CNAs in this class that have had patients come into the emergency room. They were unresponsive and they had blood sugar of 800. So normal is, is 60 to 110. They come in with this blood sugar that is eight to 10 times what it should be. So it's not just a little high, okay? What happens to them, to the type one diabetic, because there's no insulin, their blood sugar just begins to go up, go up, go up, go up. It just continues to rise. That thick, high sugar blood, in addition to the waste products that are made by the body cells burning fat and protein, can cause what's called ketoacidosis. So it can cause so much acid produced and you've got this really thick sugar-filled blood that that's what like all leads into the diabetic coma and can end up leading to death. So that is why patient comes in, they see this as their blood sugar and they're automatically gonna give them insulin. And they're gonna start to give them insulin just to try and get their blood sugar down below 200. Then the next thing comes is, well, we've got to try and figure out, are they truly diabetic? Is there something else going on? And so you can do like sugar tolerance tests. So you have them eat a certain amount of sugar and you measure how long that blood sugar stays in. If they're diagnosed as a type 1, then they are going to be a insulin-dependent diabetic. So they have to measure their blood sugar, then they have to give themselves insulin, so there was a, I want to say it's an ice skater. There's an ice skater, the girl, she's really little, but she's a type one diabetic and you can, she has like a monitor on one side. So it looks almost like this little white round pad with this little like kind of like piece sticking out. So she has a sensor so that she can actually put it up to that monitor and it'll actually sample her blood and give her her blood sugar. So she can like monitor her blood sugar multiple times a day. Some people would just do the single once a day finger stick, but that's really not how your pancreas works. Your pancreas, when your blood sugar goes over 110, your pancreas secretes insulin to bring it back down, then it stops. The next time you eat, your blood sugar goes up. Your pancreas secretes insulin, brings it back down. That's kind of the normal. So they used to just have people giving themselves insulin randomly throughout the day. And now they know that it's really based on what you eat. So if you eat foods that are really low carb content, then you're not going to need as much insulin. But if you go having the candy bar and you go having the ice cream or the jelly donut, my mother's favorite things in the world, then you're going to need more insulin to try and like bring that back down. So it depends really on what your diet is. So it is in a larger extent, really very restricting. Like you kind of start eating the same things because you know that's how it affects your blood sugar instead of going out and trying lots of things. And you're like, mm, no, I'll just have the same because I know what my blood sugar will do. Hyperglycemia is a big issue though because when you have hyperglycemia, when it's over 110, just think of it that you're putting more and more sugar in the blood. So the blood becomes more and more syrupy. It gets thicker because there's sugar, just like if you think of maple syrup versus water, right? So water pours really easily, but you take a jar of maple syrup and it flows slowly. If, you're, if you have hyperglycemia, now your blood is thick due to sugar. That means your heart has to work harder. That means that blood resists flowing because it's so thick. This is why people that have diabetes end up with capillary damage. They end up with neuropathy. What's neuropathy? Mm -hmm. Disease of the nerves. So literally what happens, some people describe it as feeling like their feet are always half asleep. You know how like if your arm falls asleep, when it wakes up, you get the pins and needles. Some people describe their legs feel like that all the time. Yeah, my mother, she says it feels like there's a piece of cardboard under her feet. Like when she walks, that puts people, older people at a big fall risk because they don't, like if they're stepping on uneven ground, they can't really feel that difference. They don't really feel it. So capillary damage, neuropathy, or loss of nerve, loss of sensation, or that sort of pain, tingling pain that they get, 
The other issue is if you damage blood vessels, then you're not getting good blood flow. So you get a cut on your foot and you have poor blood flow, that puts you at risk for what? Infections. Mm -hmm. And infections, because they don't feel it, they don't notice it, and now it's infected, they pull off their shoe and their foot's like, like all gross. <laughs> like it ends up, they get gangrene, they get really bad infections and they have to do amputation. So that's why they have this like amputation risk is high as well. Other ones, so think of like, because of that thick blood, it affects blood vessels. It also increases your risk of heart disease and stroke because the blood doesn't flow very well. So your heart's having to push really hard to squeeze and push that blood into circulation. Really small blood vessels in two organs, one in your eyes, people that are type one diabetics, oftentimes they're diagnosed by their eye doctor because they go to the eye doctor and the eye doctor, when they look in the back of your eye, it should be this kind of like red reflection because of the blood vessels that are in the back of the eye behind the retina. They'll look at this, take the picture, and you have gray spots. Gray spots means that you have areas where you don't have any blood flow. And it's because those blood vessels are very, very narrow. When blood gets really thick, it just stops flowing through them. And those areas like clot, those areas like close down. So you're at higher risk of blindness and kidney failure because you've got these filters in your kidneys. They're very small, very delicate filters. Thick blood does not flow through them very well. And so then they stop. They like stop flowing. And when they do, they like when blood stops flowing, it clots. So you start to clot off the filters. And after a while you end up having to go to dialysis. So more than half of the people that go and have hemodialysis done, typically diabetes is one of those complications that leads to that. So there's like this whole long-term issue. There's this life-threatening lack of sugar, hyperglycemia, and ketoacidosis. But then there's this long-term chronic issue that can lead to limb, limb loss. Like I know somebody lost a couple toes, then lost his foot. Then they had to take it off all the way up to the knee, all because of bad circulation. Blindness, kidney failure, having to do dialysis. Those are really big risk factors with type 1 diabetes. Now, remember I said, this is like 10% of the cases. You're either born with this or your kidney typically, your, your kidney, your pancreas usually fails like early in childhood. So by the time you hit puberty, that's usually when that it's noticed. Because so that's type, two, that's like gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes, you go from being your normal size and you increase your body volume anywhere from 10 to 20%. So that means now you have to like get oxygen and nutrients and, and in a short period of time, you have to increase the oxygen and nutrients to baby and all the structures associated with the reproductive system. And so that puts a stress on the pancreas. So for some women, their pancreas like can't keep up. It can't secrete the glucose that they, or the insulin that they need to keep their blood sugar normal. So you go and have one of those stress tests done. So they make you drink this super sweet, awful tasting stuff. And then you sit there for like 90 minutes and then they do a blood sugar test. And so you, your pancreas should be able to release enough insulin to bring that sugar level down. If it doesn't, then they start to monitor you. So they measure you and they measure you and they measure you. And depending on how long it takes for that blood sugar to come down, you may have to start taking insulin. So you may actually have to give yourself insulin to try and keep your blood sugar under control. Because remember, if the blood sugar is high, your blood is thick. If your blood is thick, then that's more pressure on your heart. That's more pressure in your blood vessels. So you have an increased blood pressure, all of those. And it usually happens, it's pretty small, but it happens and it's primarily due to jet, big rapid change in blood in the body volume is the reason, the real big reason why. But now that's only 10%. 90% is this, okay? So if you work with human patients, 90% of the people that you come in contact with that have diabetes are type 2. So when they said in this one, there's, there's about 110 million people with diabetes, 90% of that number. So 100,000, 
a hundred million, sorry, a hundred million people are type two diabetics. This is not typically, does not usually show up in childhood. This usually occurs as, a, as an adult. There are cases of type two diabetes and in, this, in children, but in this, you have less insulin and the insulin that you make doesn't work. So this is really this kind of little picture diagram that I drew is really how glucose gets into your blood, into your cells. So glucose is in the bloodstream when you eat. Your body cells have what's called a receptor and a receptor is where insulin binds, okay? So it's almost like a lock. So on your body cells, you've got the lock. Well, insulin is the key. Once insulin is there, that opens the door and allows glucose to go into your body cells. If insulin's not there, then glucose doesn't, right? It's basically like locked out. So for some people, they don't have enough insulin. And for some people, the receptors do not bind the insulin as well. So that can be a factor too. So that's when they talk about insulin resistance, that you're developing insulin resistance, that means that your insulin is not working as well as it should. Maybe you're not making as much, but a lot of times it's because there's actually less receptors. This is intimately tied to weight. So 80% of type two diabetics are overweight. And so when body fat goes up, insulin receptor numbers go down. So it is almost like a way of the body is trying to, to flip to burn more fat as a way of burning energy because of the higher body fat percentages. Some people that are overweight, even some people that are morbidly obese are not type two diabetics. But if you're overweight, you're at higher risk of developing. So just because you're overweight doesn't mean you're automatically a type two diabetic. But the older you get, the more wear and tear on your pancreas because whenever you're eating, and it's this idea that if you're overweight, then you're probably overeating in sugars. And so whenever sugar levels go up, that means you've got to have this much insulin to bring it down. So then you eat more requires this. So every time your pancreas is like putting out a lot of insulin, it can be kind of like burning itself out because of overuse, because of excessive amount of insulin secretion. So the type one diabetic, they typically don't develop the acid. They don't develop the, the coma. They don't have all of the problems like the life-threatening problems. But for them, that hyperglycemia is really the big issue. So they end up with, they start to notice problems that are related to that high blood sugar, heart disease risk, which is heart attack, stroke, hypertension because their blood sugar is higher than it should be. They have poor healing. They can develop kidney damage over time and end up having to be on dialysis. So the treatment for this is a little different. So with a type one diabetic, you have to give them insulin. They have to, right? So they, they're gonna be on insulin and monitor their blood sugar for the rest of their life. For a type two diabetic, they may need medication to help improve that insulin receptor interaction. So that's what some of the medications that are out there, but they have found a very effective treatment is even losing 10% of your body weight. So it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to end up being like lose 150 pounds, even losing 10% of your body weight as a type two diabetic shows return of insulin receptor function. So it's oftentimes it's a 20, 30, 40 pound difference where your pancreas can then manage the amount of sugar and the incidence of hyperglycemia decreases. So what they try to get you to do is just eat less carbs because carbohydrates get digested and end up becoming blood sugar. So eating less carbs and increasing exercise because that'll increase your calorie burned. So that means more burned calories is less stored calories. And that's going to kind of give something for your cells to use carbohydrates for instead of just having them as circulating. They have found that if you drop body fat percentages, that there's actually a return and improvement in insulin and receptor binding. So some people, once they become type 2 diabetics, they need to take medications. Some type 2 diabetics end up taking insulin.
My mother had to take insulin for a while. And then because of another medical complication, she lost about 35 pounds. She doesn't take insulin anymore. So she's, and it wasn't like, you know, a, it wasn't a dramatic weight loss. You know, like you hear people lost a hundred pounds, 150 pounds, whatever. It wasn't a huge dramatic amount, but it actually brought her body fat percentages down. So she has better insulin receptor binding. So one way that they now look at your blood sugar, they look at it using what they call an A1C. So A1C levels are actually in a blood test, and it's a way of monitoring the amount of blood sugar in your red blood cells. So your red blood cells, they have a lifespan of about 120 days. So they live for about four months. They're made, they get shot out into the blood, they circulate for about three or three and a half months, and then they get kind of wrinkly looking, and then they'll get filtered and pulled out. So your bone marrow is always making blood cells. So they pull some blood and they actually monitor how much sugar is inside of those red blood cells because it actually shows like a three month average. If you had hyperglycemia the day this red blood cell was made, there will be more sugar in that red blood cell. And so it's sort of like a sampling. So if your A1C numbers are less than 5.7%, then that's considered normal. So most people's are like four, four and a half, all the way up to 5.7, fine. But above 5.7, they now call that pre-diabetes. What that means is you are having periods of time where you have hyperglycemia. So your blood sugar has been above normal for prolonged periods of time because it's all caught in those red blood cells. So anywhere from 5.7 to 6.4 now, that's where they say your risk factor is high. So you can bring it down with the diet and exercise aspect, but if it continues and goes over 6.4, then you're technically considered a diabetic. And they will want to put you on medication to try and reduce your hyperglycemia. So there's a bunch of different medicines. Some medicines help insulin and the receptors bind better. Some actually cause your kidneys to excrete sugar. So if your blood sugar is too high and you take this medicine, your kidneys will flush some of that sugar out of the bloodstream. So there's different ones to try and like balance that out. But for the type 2 diabetic, it's really like this is the big, the big challenge. I mean, and like for my mother, it wasn't exercise. It was because she got really sick and like she couldn't eat for about two and a half months. So she lost like 35 pounds and that was just because of that, you know? So since then she has kind of kept it off. So she hasn't had to start taking insulin. She still takes like the metformin. She does take some of the insulin promoting types of drugs, but a lot of those have terrible side effects. People say that they just don't feel good, that there is taking that, the medications where it helps to flush glucose out of your blood in the kidneys that can give you like a horrendous infection like terrible infection. So some of the meds have some really negative side effects. So those are just the number of patients that you will see, even if you're in vet tech, like you end up taking care of the little, the little chubby dogs that come in, <laughs> whose, whose owners like feed them way too much table food and everything. And some of them are like type one diabetics. Some of them are skinny and active and you have to give them insulin or else their blood sugar like gets all out of control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so you bring them in, you check their blood sugar, mm -hmm. dogs, cats. Mm -hmm. I had, I've had friends that dogs and cats that have had diabetes that they have given them insulin and learned to like test their blood sugar. It's a, expensive though for a dog or a cat. Cause you have to come in and they have to like do it over like the whole day. So you have to get them in there first thing in the morning and they, they feed them. Then they monitor what does their blood sugar do? So like every hour they're drawing blood to see is their blood sugar going up? Does their blood sugar level off? You give them insulin to see how quickly it goes down. So there's a lot. And that's a lot of like manpower. So it's like a couple hundred bucks to do an insulin study on a dog. So it's a challenge. It can really be a challenge. But this is like, if you're going into human health care, I guarantee half your patients are diabetics. Guarantee. Because what happens if they get sick and they have poor blood flow? that they already have kidney damage. 
that they have the neuropathy, poor circulation. So if something else happens to them, this is what they call a comorbidity, right? So this means it's going to make it even harder for them to get better because they don't have good blood flow. So how are you going to have this wound on your leg heal if you don't have good circulation? So then that wound like stays infected and now it gets worse. And now you've got like your septic because of that infection. So there's having diabetes puts you at risk for a whole host of other health concerns too. It's not just, well, I got to watch what I eat kind of thing. It's not, it's really not that simple. There's a, an awful lot to it, but hyperglycemia is really kind of like the, the chronic damager. Having high blood sugar leads to all of this cardiovascular issues that ends up touching on really like everything else. All right. So other sugars. So sugar, so glucose, I said, D-glucose, most abundant monosaccharide. Galactose is only one chiral carbon different. So remember we said that glucose is like alcohols on the right, the left, the right, the right. Okay, if you were going down, D-glucose, the alcohol group on carbon 2 is on the right, carbon 3 on the left, carbon 4 and 5, it's on the right. But notice galactose, carbon 4 is switched. It's the only thing that's different between it and glucose. Galactose is part of milk sugar. So lactose is made of glucose and galactose combined. And that's pretty much its only use or only place that it's found is being part of milk sugar. One that you may have not heard of is called mannose. Mannose is interesting because it's found in cranberries. So when you eat cranberries or cranberry juice or cranberry sauce, mannose gets absorbed, but it actually gets flushed out. So rather than being maintained, it goes into the GI tract. It gets absorbed in the small intestine, but then it gets filtered out by your kidneys. So we really don't use it for energy, but on its way out through the urinary tract, mannose can actually bind to bacteria. So as mannose is exiting the body from the kidneys to the ureters to the bladder, out the urethra, out the urinary tract, it actually can attract bacteria. So if you have ever had a UTI, what do they tell you to drink? cranberry juice. So it's not just like an old wives tale. It's because of the sugar found in cranberries actually helps to flush bacteria out of the urinary tract. But if you look at it, what is this? Is this a hexose or a pentose? Mm -hmm. So see one, two, three, four, five, and there's six, right? So remember every cross is a carbon. So this would be a hexose. And is it an aldehyde or a ketone? Aldehyde. aldehyde. So this would be an aldohexose. Okay. So this one's pretty easy. Just when, if you're going to identify what kind of sugar something is, just count the number of carbons. For the most part with us, it's either a pentose or a hexose. Those are the more common monosaccharides. And if the double bond oxygen's on the end, it's an aldo. If the double bond oxygen's on carbon two, then that is a keto. Okay, so fructose. So what is fructose? Mm -hmm. So what, how would you describe what kind of sugar this is? How many carbons? Count all of them. Mm -hmm. There's six. Can you see that? So counting from the top, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it is also a hexose, but this one is a keto hexose. See the double bond oxygen on carbon two? So that makes it a keto hexose. So fructose is really the, the big ketose that we talk about. It is one that you find in honey, okay? So I always think of, of, of fructose as being like fruit sugar. Fructose sounds like fruit. So fructose is a fruit sugar. It's in combination found in fruits, honey. Fructose and glucose are what makes sucrose. So table sugar is sucrose. So that's why it's pretty common. Fructose is the sweetest of all the sugars. So 
So we'll talk a little bit about this in the next, uh, after this part. So now this, here's ribose and deoxyribose. So how many sugar, how many carbons? So that makes this a pentose. Mm -hmm. Is it an aldo or a keto? Mm -hmm. So there's an aldehyde. See the double bond oxygen on the end. So that's an aldo pentose. Where have you heard ribose and deoxyribose? Uh huh. What? Yeah, DNA. When you think of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So the D of DNA tells you this sugar is in it. Deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. So it has this sugar. So do you tell me there's only one difference between these two? Deoxyribose is missing a... Mm -hmm. Instead of an OH, it just has an H. So it's missing an oxygen. It's been deoxied. D is like removed. So it's been deoxied. It's got one less oxygen than what ribose has. So that's how its name came about. So this is the sugar you find in DNA. This is the sugar that you find in RNA. If you ever take a multivitamin and you see riboflavin written, riboflavin, ribo, has ribose in it, okay? So riboflavin is actually B2. It's one of your B vitamins. So there is a component in a vitamin that is made with this sugar. So, oh, I forgot them. So most monosaccharides, we've been drawing them looking like they're straight lines, but in fact, they're not, okay? And it all has to do with that double bond. So the aldo or the keto or that double bond oxygen, remember double bonds are more reactive than single bonds. So these pentoses and hexoses, so whether we're talking about, and we're really just going to talk about glucose and give galactose as an example, but these sugars want to Break that double bond, break that aldehyde or ketone double bond oxygen. And doing this, they form a ring. And so you may have seen them drawn, sugars like drawn like this. So it looks like it's got a ring and that ring has an oxygen in there. So that is when the straight chain forms a ring because notice now there's no double bond. So by breaking that double bond, it actually creates a more stable molecule in this ring shape. So here's how it does it. I tried to make this bigger so you could see it. So this first one, D-glucose, right? So this is glucose in the straight chain. When these carbons, remember that they have this ability to rotate. So like single bonds can rotate. If you take and bend this chain, carbon one and carbon five, their oxygens sit side by side. Like I said, I, I have them. They're just upstairs in the lab. I forgot to bring them. I had two of them. So they're like this, but when they bend, remember how you have, you can have single bonds rotate. Carbon one up at the top, that red oxygen, and the carbon five, the blue oxygen, they get really close. So that red oxygen with the double bond can open. So if the double bond opens up and it takes the hydrogen off of carbon five's alcohol. So in seeing this, see how this looks like it's opening up? And that means now this, that hydrogen is transferred over to carbon one and carbon five's alcohol loses its oxygen and it goes to, links onto carbon number one. So we make this ring, carbon one now has an alcohol group, two, three, and four all have alcohols on them, but five doesn't anymore because five's oxygen uh, um, alcohol is now part of the ring. So this, that was the OH on carbon number five. That's what that oxygen was. It lost its hydrogen to carbon number one. All the other carbons have alcohol groups except carbon number five now. And notice here, there's no double bonds that actually creates a little more stable. So a couple of things. 
depending on the way the ring closes. So when the ring closes, if carbon number one, if its alcohol group points down, they call that the alpha form. So see how this OH is pointing down? That is the alpha ring shape. And they'll put a little alpha symbol. Remember like alpha decay? So it's that funny looking little A thing. Whereas if the alcohol group is pointing up, they call that the beta. And they'll use the B. Remember the B with the little foot to it, like beta decay? So it looks just like those symbols for alpha and beta decay when we were talking about radioactive decay back in chapter two. Notice that this is a double arrow. It's reversible. So this ring can open and close and open and close. When it opens, it goes back into the straight chain. When it closes, the alcohol group can be up, which is beta, or it could be down, which is alpha. It just depends on like how it closes up. So you can have either. So there are just two possible ways that that alcohol group ends up being positioned, either pointing up or pointing down. Which OH are you looking at? Uh-huh. See the one right here? This one off of carbon one, okay? Right, see how that one's pointing down and then here it's pointing up? So the OH, huh? The OH here is, ang is angled downward. Here, the OH is coming up, okay? So if it's pointing down, that's alpha. If it's pointing up, that's beta. So that is why they would call that alpha D-glucose or beta D-glucose. Alpha D-glucose tells you the alcohol group is pointing down off of carbon one. Beta D-glucose means the alcohol group is pointing up. Okay, so we'll do an alpha. So here's kind of like the steps, and I may have written this out a little bit differently than what you have it on your PowerPoint, but I just tried to like, and I don't expect you to draw this. I just want you to see how they are done. So the first way that I would always say is you start with by putting the carbonyl carbon, that's the carbon with the double bond oxygen. So the, the, in this case, it's carbon one. If it was a ketose, it'd be carbon two. But whichever one has the double bond oxygen, it always goes over here. It's always going to go kind of like on the far right side of the molecule. So it's going to always like your right point. That's carbon number one. Then it says, put the rest of the carbon chain down. So you make an upside down question mark. So carbon one is here. So come down at an angle to make carbon two. Then go straight across to make carbon three. Then go up and make carbon four. Carbon four should be across from carbon one. So they should be kind of like evenly across. Then come up. So you're going to carbon five and that should be kind of like above carbon three. Carbon six is up here and it's not chiral. So you just write it out. Right, so remember if it's not chiral, it's not a certain specific, it's just CH2OH. So that one's up at the top. So now, like I said, carbon five, which is this one, it's oxygen forms a connection between carbon five and carbon one. That's what finishes the hexagon. So this blue oxygen right here is now what's here. So it's this oxygen is this. I can even change it and make it look blue. Well, not if I can't erase. So this oxygen is this oxygen. Okay, so do you see how I say it looks like an upside down question mark? So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, like upside down question mark kind of look. And then just link carbon one and five with an oxygen. Now on each, on everything in the ring, the position of the alcohol and the hydrogens are like locked into place. So remember when we had to make ring structures, we had the cis and the trans. So things that point down get stuck pointing down. Things that point up are stuck that way. So if we're going to do alpha, 
off of carbon one, that means that we are going to have the alcohol group pointing down. So OH points down, and that is because this is alpha. That means that a hydrogen sticks up, because remember carbon has to have four bonds. Carbon one, two, three, and four are all gonna have an oxygen, or an alcohol and a hydrogen. So this one's carbon one. Now carbon number two, three, four, are all going to have the OH, or sorry, the groups that are on this side, these will all point down. So on carbon number two, I'll have an OH. Carbon number three will have an H. Carbon number four will have an OH. So if you look at the straight chain, everything on the right side will end up pointing down in those middle chiral carbons. Everything on the left is going to end up pointing up. So that means carbon number two will have a hydrogen sticking up. Carbon number three has an OH sticking up. Carbon number four has an H sticking up. So carbon five only has a hydrogen. Do you see that it shows three? So the fourth, the fourth bond for carbon number five is a hydrogen and it hangs down. So that's like alpha deglucose. So I won't ask you to draw this, but if you see a sugar, you should be, remember, look on the far right carbon. If it points down, you know it's an alpha form. If it points up, you know it's beta. So that's one thing. If you were comparing these two, you can say this and this match because the carbon's in the middle, any alcohol or hydrogens that stick to the, are off the right side will always point down. Any that are on the left side will always point up. So that's alpha deglucose. So when we have more than one glucose linking together, we can form a link between them. It is a condensation reaction. So remember in a condensation reaction, this is where you're gonna form water. You are going to pull an OH and an H off of two molecules. And by doing that, you'll link them together. Right, so you're gonna pull an H off of one of these molecules. You're gonna pull an OH off of the other. And in doing that, you're gonna form the bond that holds them together. So look at these two. So this is both. Do you see that this is alpha? It's an alpha because see that that far right carbon has an OH pointing down, that's an alpha. So that's alpha deglucose. If I have two alpha deglucoses, I pull an alcohol group off of one carbon on one glucose, pull hydrogen off of the other. This oxygen now becomes the bridge to link them together. So that's in ether bond, they call it a glycosidic bond. So any bonds between sugars are glycosidic. So like glyco is like sugar. So a glycosidic bond is a bond between sugars. So notice how the bond kind of makes this V. That always happens if you have an alpha sugar. So see the OH sticks down so when it forms the link, now they're both kind of pointing down. So your alpha linkages are typically this V kind of shape or appearance. And this makes maltose. So this is the first disaccharide we're gonna talk about. Maltose is what you find is a grain sugar. So they call this a disaccharide because now it's two sugars. So the one on the left is maltose, the one on the right is cell bios. So the one on the left, see the link, see the kind of link, 
Now they call that link an alpha one to four glycosidic bond. So why is it alpha one to four? So it's alpha one to four because the left glucose is an alpha glucose. So notice it's OH was sticking down. So this was the alpha and it's one to four because what? What's, it's because carbon one on the left sugar is linked to carbon four on the right sugar. Do you see that? So they're like sitting side by side. Carbon one on the left sugar is linked to carbon four on the right. So that's what one to four means. It's just telling you which sugars, which carbons on the two sugars are connected. Okay, so look at the cell bios. So this is a beta one to four glycosidic bond. Why is it beta? Mm -hmm. Because again, if you always look at like the left sugar, right? So if the left sugar is sticking up, that's a beta. It was a beta glucose. That was beta D glucose. So remember going this direction, that's beta. Whereas over on the other side, see where it's going down? That's alpha. So going up, if your left sugar is going up, that's beta. If your left sugar is going down, that's alpha. And these ones, whenever you're linking like end to end, carbon one to carbon four, that's a one to four. So cell bios is like one that's artificially made But maltose, I said maltose, they sometimes call it malt sugar. This is a grain sugar. So wheat, barley, a lot of grains store a little bit of sugar in their grain because remember, this is a seed. So if you have a little grain of barley or wheat, that is like a little fertilized embryo. So all you have to do is put it in soil and add water and it'll grow and form a new plant. So this is one of the nutrients that the plant packs into the seed so that the little embryo has something to use until it can make its own energy. So you'll have stuff in there. There'll be, there'll be starchy material in grain, but there's also some sugar that's in there. Now oh, it's really bright. <laughs> it's like the last ditch efforts. So just remember maltose. I always think of like Schlitz malt liquor. <laughs> I always think of malt as like beer sugar. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's in high concentration in wheat as well as barley. And barley, roasted barley is typically what's used in fermentation into alcohol. Okay, here's the second one. So maltose is like grain sugar. Lactose is found in milk. Mm -hmm. So they call this milk sugar. So now looking at this, look at the left sugar. Is the line going up or down? Up. So remember, if it's going up, we know that's beta. So the left sugar, if the angle is going upward, it's beta. If it's going down, it's alpha. And this is linking what? Carbons one, two, four. So again, it's still linking them side by side. So the only difference between this and that cell bios is this. The left one is glucose. The right one is galactose. So this is where glucose and galactose are, are joined together. Sorry, this one's galactose. And I know because I look at that OH, it's sticking up and in glucose it sticks down. So this is glucose. So these two are joined together to make milk sugar. And the enzyme lactase breaks this, speeds up the breakdown of lactose into these two sugars. So remember we talked about lactose intolerance. First one is galactose. First one is galactose. And I can actually tell, notice that OH is sticking up. Because remember, that's carbon number four. That's the one that was different with galactose compared to glucose. So carbon one is connected to carbon four. Because they're, again, the two ends are kind of connected. Like, if you think of the two sugars, like, the left side and the right side are connected directly. So that's an alpha or a beta one to four. You always look at the left sugar to figure out if it's beta or if it's alpha, because that's the one that's carbon one. 
third one. Third one is sucrose. So sucrose is a little different looking because sucrose, you see how it looks like it's stacked one on top of the other? Sucrose is table sugar. This is sugar that is extracted from sugar cane or sugar beets. So they extract it, crystallize. It's the sugar that you've got, like when you buy a bag of sugar, it is sucrose. So sucrose is glucose and fructose. But notice how they, instead of being side by side, they are joined this way. And in fact, the carbon one of each of those is what gets linked. So it's not carbon one and four, but it's actually carbon one and carbon two. So carbon one of glucose. So remember that this was carbon one. This was this, right? Because remember it was an aldehyde. So glucose had that double bond oxygen on the end. So carbon one is the one that had the double bond. But down at the bottom, the, glu the fructose molecule, remember that it's a ketohexose. So this carbon number two was the one that had the double bond oxygen. So when these two get linked, they call this carbon one is alpha pointing down off of the glucose, but the carbon two off of fructose is sticking up. So this is why they call it an alpha beta. So you have both, both the alpha and the beta, and it's one to two because it's linking carbon one on the top sugar to carbon two on the bottom sugar. So it's sort of a different looking one. It'll always, it looks like stacked. So we've talked about all the major sugars. So looking at all of the sugars, they said, okay, table sugar, sucrose, that is our reference. So table sugar, it stimulates your taste buds. And remember, in order to taste something as sweet, it has to hit your tongue and it has to dissolve. And your taste cells have to respond. So right on the tip of your tongue is where you have a highest concentration of taste receptors for sweet, but they are scattered all over your tongue. So it's not just there, but like if you have some sugar, you like dip the tip of your tongue in it. That's just a way of tasting sweet because that's the most, the highest concentration. So they said, okay, if, if you just put some sucrose on your tongue, you would say that sweetness is like a hundred. So it's a relative scale. Fructose is one and a half times sweeter. But then look at the other sugars. So remember, fructose is a monosaccharide, sucrose is a disaccharide, but glucose, maltose, galactose, lactose, they're all what? Way less, okay? So sucrose and fructose are much higher on the sweetness scale. These are really pretty low. Really low sweetness, that's why they say milk, it's not sweet tasting. Like if you just drink milk, it doesn't really taste sweet because lactose on a scale of zero to 100 only is a 15. So it has a pretty low sweet scale. But remember I told you if you are you're, um, have lactose intolerance, you can add lactase, the enzyme, or you can buy lactate milk. So lactate milk has, has lactose already digested. So is glucose and galactose and glucose is a lot sweeter. So that's why they say like the lactate milk tastes sweeter. Well, it's because it's got glucose in it compared to just lactose. So it would trigger or stimulate your sweet receptors. So what about some of these others? What do you know about these? Xylitol, erythritol, sorbitol. These are all called... Sugar alcohols, okay? Sugar alcohols, they taste sweet. Notice on the sweetness scale, like xylitol is just as sweet as sucrose. Erythritol is a little less, sorbitol is a little less than that, but they're sugar alcohols, but they don't affect blood sugar. They're not digested, they don't get absorbed. So this is why sweets or candies that are sweetened with these won't affect your blood sugar. 
this is why they put these in diabetic candy. Okay, so somebody that gets sugar-free candies, like Russell Stover makes like sugar-free candy, that's what it's got in it. It's got these three sugar alcohol types, so you get the sweetness, but it's not going to affect your blood sugar. Anybody know anything about xylitol? Yes, a lot of sugar-free gum has xylitol, erythritol, or sorbitol, and those like, have you ever noticed, like, sugar-free gum? You can chew it a long time, and it still keeps that flavor. Like, the gum might get hard, but it still has this kind of flavor to it. That is because, like, it doesn't dissolve easily, so it stays in the gum compared to, like, like bubble gum, right? Bubble gum, you chew it five or ten minutes, and all the flavor goes away, and then you're just like, <laughs> like, remember, like, the, the pink double bubble? Like, it would just lose its sweetness, but sugar-free or sugarless gum keeps the sweetness longer. But there is a huge caution with xylitol. And it's yes. Okay. Yep. If you buy low sugar peanut butter, xylitol, because it is a sugar alcohol, it still tastes sweet, but it doesn't affect your blood sugar. So people opt for it. So they put it in sugarless gum. And so, you know, like the, what are the different brands? Um, now I can't think in my head, but you know, like you can buy like a little tub container of gum. Okay. Like, like Trident and oh, like, ice uh-huh. Icebreakers, those. So you can buy. And so there's like 50, 60 pieces of gum in this one. It's like the little car one. <laughs> so you can stick it in your car cup holder and there you've got your gum for like long haul gum. <laughs> but xylitol for you, it doesn't affect your blood sugar, but it does affect a dog's or a cat's. In some animals, specifically dogs and cats. I actually saw a posting about this. Somebody's lab passed away because they didn't realize. They didn't know. And literally their dog got like their little container of sugar-free gum and like ate it all. And they didn't realize that it had xylitol in it. So what it does, it acts like insulin. Okay. So, so xylitol causes their blood sugar to like go well below 60. So it like just drops to nothing. And so they're just like, they just like fall out. Like they have absolutely no blood sugar. So they have absolutely no, no energy, don't move. They look like you like come home and you're like, what happened? They just collapsed. So you don't raise your blood sugar, then your brain can't keep running. So that's where it can cause irreparable, like the brain to just shut down. So your brain really doesn't even need insulin. Your brain gets sugar as long as your blood sugar is over 60. Even if your blood, if your blood sugar is 800, your brain get what gets what it needs. It doesn't require insulin. But if blood sugar goes too low, then the brain can't get insulin or it can't get glucose because there isn't any. And so, yeah, there was somebody that had it. And they posted like the, pe the little container. It was all chewed up. And so after the fact, they just didn't know. So not all of the sugar alcohols are a challenge, but if you ever, like I don't buy that kind of gum, like the gum I buy is erythritol. <laughs> like I specifically look, nope, not buying that. Like I don't even bring it in the house just because like with my luck, somebody would be like, oh, and leave it out. And then my dogs would end up eating it. So xylitol is a big no. Like I, I just don't even keep it around. So here's the other interesting thing is, look at these. So remember we said the scale is zero to a hundred. Sucralose, which is found in Splenda, it has a sweetness scale of 60,000. So zero to a hundred was the normal scale. Remember table sugar is a hundred. Saccharin, 45,000. Stevia, which is the only natural. This is our natural, a natural component. It was found in a plant. The stevia plant, they extracted it. And it's like 25,000, 250 times sweeter than sugar is. But agave is, it still is a component. It's a mixture of fructose and glucose. So it still is a normal sugar. So it's not like a completely separate molecule. So it's, it's more in the range of the other ones. 
on the previous page because it's a natural sugar that doesn't have this. So aspartame, which you have like an equal 18,000. So most of these artificial sweeteners, when you open these packages and you pour it like into your tea, how much is in there? Is it like a teaspoon? No, it's like, it's like, you like go, I don't think there's really any came out. Well, it's because it, you don't, you can use 250 times less. You don't need anywhere near as much. Some people still say these have like a bitter aftertaste and it really depends on your taste buds. So your taste buds, it's genetically determined how you taste things. Some people like the taste of sauerkraut. Some people don't like it at all. Some people like the taste of kale. I like it. But not, nobody else I know does. <laughs> so that all comes into play, like, to your taste buds because they're genetically determined. Like, to me, Diet Coke is really bitter. And other people are like, no, it's really sweet. And I'm like, no, nope, I can't stand it. Oh, well, that's because of sugar. Yeah. And that's just because you get used to not having something that's super sweet. So when you have something like a, like a regular soda, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like overly sweet but people that drink it every day it's normal mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't taste unusual at all but yeah so and i know people that like drink diet cokes like a liter of it at least a day and they say it's sweet tasting that they don't notice a bitter aftertaste i'm like no mm -mm, tastes terrible but this is all because much higher and it all has to do with it's just contacts those taste receptors and strongly stimulates them. Oh, time to it. So interesting fun fact, the um, stevia, when they first found Truvia, when they first detected, like somebody must have been sucking on some leaves or something, because like, that's really strange. Like they, so it's this plant, you pick the leaves off of this plant, they dry it, grind it up, and it like, they use it like sugar. It's really sweet. When they first put it out on the market, they literally just took the leaves, dried it, ground it up, packaged it, and sold it. And people were like, I'm not putting green stuff in my tea because the crystals, the powder was green because it still had the chlorophyll. It still had the green part of the plant. So they had to take it off the market. They had to actually extract this, this the Truvia molecule out of it or the Stevia molecule. They had to extract the sugar compound away from the green plant residue and then put it back on the market and it has sold really well. <laughs> exactly the same, had no like, didn't really need to do that different extraction, except for the fact that people were like, I don't want to put anything green in my coffee. I want it to look, it needs to look like white crystals. If I'm going to use it, it's going to look like white crystals. So sort of an interesting, interesting fact. All right. So next time we will finish, this basically finishes all of the simple sugar stuff. So next time we just got to finish the um, polysaccharide. So that's like the rest, another 15 slides and we'll be done.